thank you, Lon, very much uh, for the for the introduction for the introduction for the invitation to this wonderful gathering. Today, my talk is going to be a little bit different in two respects. Um, first, I'm going to talk about cats, not dogs or pigs or dodos. And secondly, I'm not going to talk so much about anthropomorphism and how it occurs, but to take advantage of that to basically uh, sucker students into learning some science. So let's start with cats. Cats are the most popular pets in the United States, 84 million pet cats, as well as 100 million feral cats. As Harriet uh, talked to us, cats have fascinated and intrigued people throughout the ages, from the Egyptians through the Renaissance, Lewis Carroll, and of course, more recently, I think cat interest in cats, they've become uh, pop culture icons. Perhaps uh, everyone knows the cat in the hat, some of you may remember Morris the finicky cat, the older ones amongst you, Garfield, the uh, international sensation Hello Kitty, and of course that brings us to Grumpy Cat. Speaking of Grumpy Cat, he's just one of several cat celebrities who pull down seven-figure incomes every year in their appearance fees and so on. And as you know, cats are all over the internet. In fact, the internet International Cat Video Festival <laughs> toured the United States for four years, sometimes selling out entire stadiums, as shown here in St. Paul. So people love cats, they're fascinated by them. Well, I decided to take advantage of this fascination to teach a course centered on cats that Lan mentioned, Lan mentioned the science of cats. And the reason I taught this cat, is it, uh, this class, <laughs> is that it turns out that Scientists are studying cats in the same way they study wild animals. Just as we go out into the field and study lizards or elephants or giraffes, the same techniques are being used and the same questions are being asked. And so I realized that there was an opportunity to basically trick students into learning a lot of science. They're taking this class because they think they're inter because they're interested in cats, and they will learn a lot about of cats. But they're also learning a lot about basic issues in ecology, evolution, and behavior. And so what I'd like to do today is tell you some of the main questions we've been talking about, about how scientists are, un are studying cats and learning uh, using the same techniques that evolutionary biologists and others use. And I want to focus on three primary questions. First, where did the house cat come from? Secondly, to what extent are they domesticated? And finally, third, what impact are they having on the environment? So let's start with the first question. Where did cats come from? Well, traditionally, there have been a number of ancestors, a turn, uh, potential ancestors. It turns out that throughout the old world, there are wildcat species or subspecies, they're classified in different ways, that are very similar to the domestic house cat. And for quite a long time, scientists have debated which one of these is the ancestor of the modern house cat. Or in fact, is it possible that the house cat was domesticated multiple times in different places? with different, uh, with, in other words, there are multiple derivations of the house cat. This has been studied in two different ways. The traditional approach is a historical one, where we look at the historical evidence. And this is what paleontologists and archaeologists do. And it turns out in recent years, there have been a number of wonderful findings increasing our knowledge of the ancient history of the house cat. The oldest uh, domesticated cat is found from the island of, C of Cyprus. And what button do I push here? The red one, oh, that one. There we go. Uh, this is a skeleton of a child buried with a kitten. Here's a drawing of it from Cyprus 9,500 years ago. It is argued that the placement of the kitten uh, indicates that it is the, a domestic cat. Also, the fact that Cyprus does not have any wild cats, so that this cat or its ancestors must have been brought over from somewhere in the Middle East. Uh, there recently have been a find of, of, of a domesticated cat in Egypt 6,000 years ago. And if we look more generally, we can see that most of the oldest finds of, of house cats are in the near and mid-east, suggesting that this is where the house cat was initially domesticated. Notice I've crossed out several of these findings because even in the last seven years since this paper was published, there have been some updates. And we'll get back to the China point in, in a moment. The second way of looking at this is through the more modern, if you will, approach to look at the DNA to compare the DNA of house cats to those of wildcat species to see if we can see where, to which species the house cat is related. And so the results of these studies have been pretty definitive. That This is an evolutionary tree of the wildcat species, and you'll see that domestic cats very clearly are related to only one type of wildcat, the Middle Eastern wildcat. 
indicating first that domestic cats came from the Middle East, and second, indicating that there is no evidence for multiple origins of the house cat. If the house cat had been domesticated multiple times from different species, we would see some of them grouping with these other species, but we do not see that. So the congruence of the archaeological and the genetic data make clear that the house cat was indeed domesticated somewhere in the mid or near east. Now this is what we thought we knew as of about five years ago. However, there was a find, an archaeological finding in China that, that was very unexpected. The oldest uh, house cat in China was from about 2,000 years ago. And then they found some remains from 5,000 or more years ago of what appeared to be domesticated cats. And this did not agree with any of the other data. It suggested either that house cats had been domesticated separately in China, or somehow they had gotten over here several thousand years earlier from the Mideast than previously had been uh, understood. Uh, this discrepancy, however, was resolved when zoologists took a closer look at the actual bones of the putative domestic cats. And what they discovered was that, in fact, these were not house cats at all. These were Asian leopard cats, a different species of wild cat, not at all closely related to the wild cats and the house cat. But apparently what happened is that in China they domesticated an entirely different species, the Asian leopard cat. And for some reason this domestication event did not last. They went extinct and then subsequently, several thousand years later, the house cat was brought over or moved over from the Middle East. Now, I do need to point out that I understand that there is some debate about this finding. There is nothing published, but we may not have heard the last word on whether the Asian leopard cat was domesticated. Now, there's a second means of testing the archaeological inferences drawn about the spread of house cats, and that is to look at the DNA of ancient, uh, of ancient specimens. You may be aware that there are many mummified cats from Egypt. And in fact, if you look at these cat mummies, if you x-ray them, there are in fact cats inside of them. They are actual cat mummies. Apparently what happened is that the Egyptians raised enormous numbers of cats which were slaughtered, mummified, and sold as religious offerings. People would go to a religious event, buy one of these mummies, and then leave it at the temple as a, an offering to the gods. A few years ago, scientists tried to extract DNA from some of these mummies, and they succeeded in doing so they, from three mummies. And they discovered that, in fact, these ancient uh, mummies had the same DNA as cats in Egypt today, showing a connection from, that, uh, from the past to, to more recently. However, just this fall, two months ago, there was reports of a project out of France, not actually yet published, but at least in the news, where scientists have looked at many different archaeological specimens from throughout the range of house cats and ranging from about 8,000 years ago to the Middle Ages, extracting DNA and charting the spread of house cats out of the Middle East based on DNA connections. And what they've found is that what we thought from the archaeological data is completely supported, that the oldest specimens do appear in the Near East. They quickly spread to Egypt. From Egypt, they spread both to the east into Asia, and north into Greece, and then into the rest of Europe. And it appears, in fact, that the Vikings moved cats up into Greenland, into England, and to elsewhere. And so this is all based on ancient DNA. Now we can also look at the genetics of cats by looking at modern day cats. And this is a study of some geneticists from a few years ago, where they collected samples of random bred cats from around the world. By random bred, I mean basically mutts. Cats that have no, are not purebreds, they're either just a mix of pedigrees or sometimes even street cats. And what this analysis showed is in fact there is geographic differentiation, that they are genetically differentiated in different parts of the world, indicating that the cats spread out and then the populations became somewhat isolated, enough that they could uh, uh, evolved to become genetically distinct. Well, based on this, we can now ask, where did the different breeds of cats that we know today come from? And in particular, a number of breeds of cats are named after geographic regions. And we might ask, is the Abyssinian cat really from Abyssinia? The Siamese cat from Siam? And, and so on. And in fact, there's one cat, the Egyptian Mao, that looks like the cats you see painted on, on the Egyptian tomb walls and so on. And there are some claims that these, this breed was developed by the Egyptians and has persisted to this day. Well, we can test these ideas by looking at the, at the genetics of these purebred cats and comparing them to cats in different regions. 
This is a representation of those genetic data I just showed you, put on, on two axes. The colored dots are the different random bred cats. And so over here we have the Asian cats, down here the Middle Eastern and Near Eastern cats, here are some from Southern Africa, here are the European ones. What we see is that in fact some breeds, the breeds of cats are the open circles, and we can see that some breeds of cats actually do associate with Asian cats, in particular the Siamese, the Burmese, and the Korat all appear to be derived from, from Asian cats. Now this actually is completely expected because there are records of Asian cats going back to at least the 14th century. There's a document called the Tamra Meu, which means cat treatises, written in Thailand, several documents from the 14th to the 18th century, in which they describe the cats of this region, and they very clearly describe Siamese and other cats. And so, in fact, some breeds of cats do have relatively old ancestry out of Asia. Most breeds, however, do not. Most breeds clump with the European cats. So, for example, the Abyssinian cat, not from Abyssinia. It's very similar to the Cornish Rex. The Persian, nope, it's from Britain. Here's the British short hair and the Scottish fold. Even the Egyptian Mao has a lot of European blood in it, although it is close to the Near Eastern ones as well. Now again, so what this indicates is that most breeds of cats appear to be relatively recent in origin, despite the names and stories associated with them. This actually makes sense because cat breeding really didn't develop until the, near the end of the 19th century, when people in Britain and then the United States uh, started breeding cats, and they derived the different types, often trying to make them look like various things, such as what the Egyptian ancient cats looked for. But the genetic data do agree with these, these stories. Most breeds are not ancient in origin. Speaking of breeds, cats really aren't all that different from one another. When we compare the, the breeds of dogs, most cats are different only minor, in minor ways in their coat length and their color and so on. However, in recent years, this has changed as a, a whole new breed of breeds, if you will, is being developed that are much different from your standard idea of a cat. Now, to get a better idea of this, I took my class this September to the Cape Cod Cat Show on Cape Cod to see what different breeds of cats were like. I'm guessing that many of you have never been to a cat show, but you're probably familiar with dog shows like the Westminster Dog Show. Let me tell you, this is not what happens in a cat show. You can't run them around a ring. This is what happens. Judges poke and prod cats, seeing if they conform to the physical standards of the breed. They wave a little feather to see if they're appropriately bouncy and, and friendly and so on. Here's another judge with an enormous Maine Coon. This is one of my students, Anthony, practicing to be a judge with a Japanese bobtail. Uh, here the students are examining a, a cat breed called a savanna. It turns out that the breeders of the cats are just as interesting as the breeds themselves. We learned a lot about what sort of person develops and breeds new cat breeds. My favorite has to be the Sphinx and this woman who is very devoted to them. But speaking of the Sphinx, it is an example of these new types of breeds of cats. This is a cat that looks very different from most cats. Here's another view of a Sphinx. They basically have very fine hair, so much so that they look to be hairless. And this appearance is the result of a single genetic mutation, and then the breeders breeding related animals that have these mutations to develop a new breed. And that's how the Sphinx was developed uh, several decades ago, but this has really taken off in the last few years. For example, here is the Lycoi, or werewolf cat. This appearance is the result, again, of a single genetic mutation that gives them this odd appearance. Or even more different or disturbing, if you'd like, the Munchkin cat. This is a genetic mutation that causes very short limbs. Basically, this is the dachshund of the cat world, and this they have been uh, interbred to produce a breed. Apparently they're genetically quite healthy, unlike many purebred dogs, or so it is argued. Things, however, get even worse. Um, the worst possible thing, what could you cross a munchkin with that would make it worse? A sphinx. And now the minskin cat. You have to wonder who would want a cat like this. So one source of these new, very different types of breeds is just taking selected mutations, breeding related individuals, and to fix that trait. But there's another, another way of getting very different cats. Remember the Asian leopard cat? Would it be possible to cross one with a house cat, say with an Egyptian Mao? 
Well, you wouldn't think so, because the leopard, Asian leopard cat and the house cat are not that closely related. Here's their position in the cat evolutionary tree. They're not close to each other. And if you look, their common ancestor, they, their last common ancestor existed six million years ago. You would not think two such different animals could interbreed. But if you thought that, you would be wrong. And the interbreeding has led to this quite lovely animal, the Bengal cat, which is now its own breed and has become very popular. It's called the Bengal. They're very active, uh, wild cats, uh, but apparently very affectionate as well, and of course quite beautiful. This has been taken even one step further with this animal here. This is the serval from Africa. It's a very long-legged cat. By small cat standards, it's quite large. It can get up to 30 pounds. It jumps remarkably well. And if you thought that the Asian leopard cat shouldn't be able to breed with house cats, then there's no way that servals should. They've been separated by more than 9 million years. And yet, sure enough, it works. And now this cat here, the savanna, a large, long-legged cat, is one of the most popular new breeds of cats. And I just have to show you what one of these are, cats is like. This is Zoe, the savanna, showing off. Well, I'll show you what he's showing off. Well, with that, let's move to the second question. In what ways, if at all, are cats domesticated? Well, first, what the term domesticated mean is it means is actually a topic of great debate among scholars. There are lots of different definitions. But one key aspect of considering whether something is domesticated is how different an animal is from its wild ancestor. How much has it changed genetically and in overall appearance? And of course, dogs, as we just heard, are very different. We know they're different in their appearance, their behavior. They do things that wolves do not do at all. So dogs are quite distinctive, and they're very domesticated. With cats, however, the story is very different. If you think about it, what are the differences between the Middle Eastern wild cat and Winston? Winston's my cat. The answer is, there aren't very many differences. Uh, house cats meow to each other and particularly to their owners. Wild cats don't do that. The tail up greeting that you're probably familiar with is something that wild cats do not do. Uh, house cats live in groups. This is very unusual in felines other than lions and male cheetahs. Most other felines are entirely solitary, but this is not true of course in house cats in some situations. And of course house cats are docile around hu humans. So there are some differences between house cats and wild cats there are not very many differences, and they're not very substantial. And moreover, as we're all aware, house cats will readily revert to a wild state. We'll talk about feral cats in just a moment, but it's not very hard for them to become very similar to their ancestors. Recently, geneticists decided to look at, are there genetic differences, or how many? They sequenced the genome of uh, several house cats, as well as wild cats, and they looked for genetic changes, and they could only find basically three differences very few genetic differences between house cats and wild cats. So the bottom line is when people say that cats aren't domesticated or they're semi-domesticated, they have a point. There aren't very many differences between the house cat and its wild ancestors. But that led me, or has led researchers to ask, well, what is it that house cats actually do, especially when they go back out in the wild? And what is particularly exciting to me is that scientists are now using the same methods to study wild animals, such as radio tracking and so on, they're applying these approaches to house cats. And so, for example, researchers are putting GPS units on house cats so you can track where they go. And they're actually putting what are called kitty cams, a little camera around the neck of a house cat so you can actually see a cat's eye view of where it's been. And I should do want to point out that there's a spectacular documentary, the BBC, you can find it online, about one great study in England where they did this. Well, here's just some of the results of GPS studies, or some examples of them. These are two cats. This is a Google Earth map, and just tracing the activity of a cat over several days. Its home is right here, and it wanders kind of all over the place in a moderately large area. And the same thing, this cat here. But sometimes the cats do things that are very interesting. This cat, most of the time it's around its home, but all of a sudden it took a straight line several blocks to another house down here. Well, it turns out that when this happened, the cat's owners went away for the weekend, and this was its former home. And so it just found its way straight back to its old house, found out the owners weren't there either, and then returned. 
This cat also mostly was active around here, had one excursion up here. You see it's pretty much in a house. Right here is in the middle of another house. Turns out the cats have multiple homes. Now, if you have a cat and it goes out, you might think that it's your cat, but in fact, you're probably sharing the cat with several other people. That this is, turns out to be very common that house cats will visit other places. And so we've learned a lot about the ranging patterns of cats in different contexts. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, the other thing that people are using is kitty cams to see what happens to cats. Since so we are just a few vignettes from a cat, here's one. So remember, the, the camera is under its throat. So this is the cat's chin. Here's an encounter with another cat, not so friendly. Here's an inquisitive dog. It turns out that cats cross roads disturbingly often and get into other places that you wouldn't want to know that your cat is going. And they encounter native wildlife, such as this opossum right here. But perhaps the most important finding from these studies is, take a look at that picture for a moment and see if you can figure out what it is. It is a chipmunk in the mouth of a cat. And it turns out that cats are preying on, on wild animals a lot. And in fact, they're doing it a lot more than you think because only a fraction of the time do they actually bring the prey back home. Often they eat it or just kill it and leave it in the wild. And sometimes, I just want to show you this video because sometimes the kitty cams take videos. Here's a cat in the woods and there is a frog, right? Where is that frog? Right there, there's a frog. Boom, the cat caught it. And so that leads to, oh, I should say there have been a, a lot of studies coming out of these, these approaches. But that leads to our third question. What impact are cats actually having on the environment? We know they catch lots of rodents and rabbits and so on, but particularly they catch, or particular, people are particularly concerned about them catching birds. Smithsonian scientists in 2013 estimated, based on a, a meta-analysis of many studies, what the actual toll of house cats in the U.S. was. They came up with an estimate of 1.3 to 4 billion birds and 6 to 22 billion mammals. So an enormous uh, number of prey items they're eating. Some countries have responded to this by taking measures to limit cats. In Australia and New Zealand now, there are laws trying to get people to not let their cats out and trying to capture and remove feral cats. And by remove, I mean killing them. And why are Australia and New Zealand doing this? Because cats have caused the extinction of many species already in those places. 20-some species in Australia, a number in New Zealand, and there are many other species threatened by these introduced predators. And so Australia and New Zealand are taking this this very seriously. In the United States, however, the response is much more muted. And the reason is that although conservationists and what you might call bird lovers are very concerned about the toll of cats, there is another group that is very concerned about the welfare of the cats themselves. And they actually are fe feeding and sustaining feral cat populations. And unfortunately, these two groups are at loggerheads. They have different concerns and they do not talk well with each other. To understand this a little better, my cat class went out with a woman who spent her entire life taking care of house cats in Boston. She's a, a school bus driver. She's not financially well off. She's not very healthy. But every night from midnight to 5 a.m., she drives around some of the worst parts of Boston feeding house cats. And we went with her and saw what she did. Here's one of the colonies that she feeds. She knows all of these cats by name. She's known some of them for 10 years or more. And it was striking to see the devotion and the, uh, the compassion she has for these animals. And we have a real problem with these issues because these two groups don't, they just are, have different concerns. And unfortunately, uh, they're not talking to each other. This book just came out this fall and instead of uh, intelligent scientific discourse, there was just vitriol in response. And unfortunately, there are real issues. We don't know, know what we need to know. For example, who are these animals that are being killed by the house cats? If it's a billion pigeons, maybe we don't care so much. If it's a billion endangered species, it's a big deal. But we don't actually know the identity. And there are researchers now that are conducting the sort of research we really need to know to answer these questions. But I want to finish by just saying there's one silver lining from, possibly, from an unexpected source. And it's from this animal, the coyote. This is a coyote that showed up in Queens a year or two ago. You've probably heard about it. Coyotes have spread all over the United States. They initially were found in the West and the Midwest, but in the last century, they've spread throughout the country, and they're getting into urban areas. You may not be aware, but carnivores often kill smaller carnivores. It's quite well documented throughout the animal world. 
They do that probably to remove threats to their young and to remove com competitors. But big carnivores, big predators, kill little ones. And it turns out the same is true that coyotes kill cats. Now, I'm certainly not endorsing that, but it turns out that it may be a way of keeping cats from places they shouldn't be. In fact, there is now research going on documenting just that. Uh, for example, this is a study in North Carolina. Here's one house cat. It stays around houses and away from all the areas that the coyotes are occupying. And there are many examples of this. Also, people use trail cameras to just see what's around. And they find that in around yards, you get cats. In small little patches of urban forest, you get both. But in protected areas, you get only coyotes. And so the cats aren't dummies. They understand not to go where coyotes are. And so it may well be that the spread of coyotes may be protecting birds and other animals in their natural habitats. We can hope that that may be the case. There's actually one old study from San Diego that shows exactly that happening. So maybe we will find out that this problem isn't as much of an issue as we think it is if cats are just staying in urban areas, eating pigeons and other not so important to animals, maybe we don't have the conservation issue. Obviously, more work is needed. Well, I'm out of time, so I'm not going to tell you my future directions other than to say that maybe, maybe we like cats because we have parasites. Some people think that that's, there's a reason for that. And it's certainly going to be interesting to understand the genetic basis of differences in behavior among the different breeds of cats. Well, thank you very much.